So we're delighted now that Francie Malloy joins us in the Raw studio. Francie was a member of the Northern Irish Assembly from 1998 until 2013, where he then won that by-election in Mid-Ulster to replace Martin McGuinness as a Member of Parliament for Mid-Ulster. Uh, thanks for joining us firstly. Thank you. Um, Tell us why you've come up to Warwick uh, this particular time. Well, we were doing a series of meetings uh, throughout England, Scotland and Wales uh, from Fianna Fianna's point of view, talking about Europe and particularly talking about Brexit and the difficulties that Brexit was creating for the Irish people mm. and also trying to get the message across to the Irish community here in Britain particularly. So we suggested with the, a number of different discussions around universities uh, and this invitation came up. So at that time... Is before the general election. I, uh, so since that, we're no longer an MP, but uh, we're in the in the same role uh, of actually trying to get the message across of what is actually happening and what effects Brexit will have. Now, the talk tonight was obviously quite a range of perspectives on borders, and you obviously come at it from the Irish point yeah. of view. Um, first things first, I mean, could you give us a general outline of, because obviously you're a Sinn Féin member of Parliament, but you don't take up your seat in the Commons. Yeah. Now, some people, you know, perhaps like me, quite ignorant watching this, won't understand why that is. Would you mind just giving a brief outline of why you well, don't take your seat up? We're elected uh, to Westminster from the different constituencies, but Sinn Féin took a policy back in 1918 that mm. we actually wouldn't take our seats. And was, at that time, it was quite different uh, on the line that we were getting elected and we having a mandate but we wouldn't take our seats. And because of Irish independence, that we were withdrawing from Westminster to set up at that time the Irish Doll, which was the Irish Parliament. Uh, that was put down by the British at that particular stage. And then we had the Civil War, and, and you had then the new Irish government being set up and, and the different... Route. So Sinn Féin retained the policy of abstentionism from Westminster. We do everything else except sit in Westminster. Mm. So we, we lobby within the Westminster Parliament. we the, One of the benefits is we can lobby all the political parties because <laughs> we're not in opposition to any of them. Mm. That but we also provide a constituency service right across our own constituencies where we're providing the daily issues that people deal with and for both sections of the community, you know, unions, nationals, wherever the people come from. Uh, and we would find that you know, large portions of the unionist population would actually use our office in the same way as they use any other MP's mm. office. And we welcome that because it gives an opportunity and an openness for us to provide a service right across the constituency. And then we lobby in Westminster. And just to clarify, so you don't get a Member of Parliament salary, but you do get the offices in Westminster? We get the offices and we get expenses, but we don't get a salary. Mm. Uh, so we, the party basically pay us as a be the MPs. So we are very much on the standard industrial <laughs> wage in that situation. Uh, we don't get the, the salaries that MPs get, but we provide the same service. Now, we do have the offices in, in Westminster, and we have uh, Joe Dwyer, who is actually our person there all the time, and we use those offices to lobby and to bring people in and to bring people over from Ireland as well to actually make lobbies and to make representation on their behalf. Now, this might seem like a fairly simplistic point, given the kind of archaic nature of the Irish Troubles, but might, some people might argue that, you know, UKIP disagree with the European Parliament, they still uh, take up their seats, and there the Lib Dems disagree with the House of Lords. I mean, can you ever see a situation where Sinn Féin actually, you know, use their seats in Westminster to vote on things that might affect Northern Ireland? I can't see it in, in you know, the foreseeable future. I think the difference is that you, you go to the European Parliament, you, you take your seat and there's nobody questions it. Mm. But you go to Westminster, you have to take an oath of allegiance to the British Queen. Uh, so we are Irish Republicans who are fighting to separate from the British control. And for to give allegiance, I think, would be very wrong because you're actually saying you give true allegiance to the, the British Queen uh, when we don't. Uh, so I think we have been honest about it and we don't do it uh, and we, we don't take it. And I would find it very difficult to actually, mm. as an Irish Republican, to give allegiance to a foreign monarch in that situation. And in a sense, I think it's, that is outdated on itself. I think I'm elected by the people of Mid-Ulster and I believe that I should be entitled to take my seat as a, a representative of the people of Mid-Ulster without having to give an allegiance to any government in that situation. Now, your personal position on the EU and Sinn Féin's, I mean, you're not exactly Europhiles, you don't, you know, love the EU, but the issue of the borders is the is the kind of crucial issue. 
What impact do you think Brexit is going to have on the either soft or hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland? Yeah, well, we've always had a very critical engagement with Europe uh, over the years, and we have fought against referendums and uh, issues around it, or fought for referendum, and we have been trying to actually, you know, be critical engagement with Europe, uh, and we have four MEPs now who represent the largest number of MEPs in Ireland. Uh, right north and south so it's, it's the one party that represents both north and south in Europe but one of the things that we do see that Brexit would break up the whole political agreements that have been made particularly around the Good Friday Agreement because the Good Friday Agreement was based on reconciliation and the coming together of everyone within the island of Ireland mm. it was voted for north and south so it was endorsed by the people of Ireland something that hasn't happened in any other act within the island of Ireland so we are now seeing a situation where Brexit could break all of that up, that borders would be reimposed, dividing the country up, partitioning the country again. Now, the British partitioned it in the 1920s. Now we actually would have a situation where people in the Good Friday Agreement had voted for an ending of borders, an ending of partition. You still had the two different jurisdictions good enough, but you had no visible border. And so there were very clear line that politics were vocal. Politics was delivering for the people. And now if we find a border being reimposed again where people have stopped at checkpoints, they've been restricted on their, their movements, restricting on their development, economic development, mm. all of that, we find that that would be counter for the, the politics to show in the politics walk, that it would be a step backwards and that people actually wouldn't have the opportunity of actually being able to develop the relationship. We want to nullify the border. We want to actually wipe the border out of that situation. And we have the North-South Ministerial Council, which members from the South and members from the North meet. We have the East-West, which is from the British government, from the, the, the Scottish and the Welsh assemblies and the Irish government, all coming together as well. So instead of actually bringing people together, Brexit is going to divide them all. You know, for a while within Europe, it was outward thinking and people were being generous and mm. people were coming together. Now we find it's by inward thinking and it's back to Little Britain. And that's the difficulty. One of the things, again, that I think you mentioned in your talk today that you're quite critical about is you don't want to see the United States of Europe. Um, could you just clarify your position on that? Well, I think we have, we have one problem because you know, we, we find ourselves moving out of the, the British Empire and what was the British Empire mm. and, and looking for independence and freedom from that to make our own decisions to self-determination for the Irish people. And then for that to be brought back into a European which has aspirations for a European army, for a European empire, the United States of Europe. We we don't want to see that at all. We want to see the individual nation being able to contribute within Europe, but actually not being dictated to by Europe, or not being dictated to by the majority of the big countries within Europe that would just simply impose it on a small nation like Ireland. So we, we don't want to move out of one empire into another empire. We want to have individual, we want the, the, the nation state in Ireland to be recognised, and we want that to be a United State of Ireland, and instead of actually a United States of Europe. Now, Francie, many people watching this might be kind of aspiring politicians. You fought a by-election in 2013. You then had to fight the general election in 2015. You've now got another general election in 2017, as well as fighting all of the assembly seats. I mean, firstly, what advice would you give to people fighting elections and wanting to be members of parliament? Well, one thing, I, I always love elections. and I, I, I was involved... <laughs> no in, shortage, though. No <laughs> shortage, though. But I was involved in elections from I was, no, 16 years of age, and, and for other parties, one thing and And Sinn Féin always were upstairs from uh, elections and w with a good Friday agreement we actually got a situation there where everybody could come into the new assembly mm. and where Sinn Féin took our seats for, for 70 years we had boycotted Stormont and we never took our seats in that situation now we have an opportunity there of actually participating and working with other parties and hopefully that will come back to you but in regards to elections itself I think you know, for young people particularly there is a great opportunity for engagement with people for actually working with people and delivering for people. One of the things I like about the elected representative thing is that you can deliver for people. You can give people back you know, their support and you can actually get their involvement, and get their ideas and bring those ideas forward. Whether it be council, whether it be assembly or Westminster, the opportunities are there within it. I actually preferred the, the councils because I found that council being local 
and actually having the power that you could deliver quicker. Mm. That sometimes the bureaucracy of parliaments uh, and establishments, the same in Europe, that it's actually one step removed from the ordinary people. Whereas in council level, you can actually deliver it on the day and you can actually start to represent people in a very clear way. One of the big kind of political moments in Ireland this year was the death of Martin McGuinness, who was, of yeah. course, the Member of Parliament for your seat before you um, fought the by-election in 2013. Now, he polarises British opinion, depending on kind of your ideology. What kind of memories do you have of Martin McGuinness from a personal point of view? Yeah, well, I have very good memories. Uh, one of the things, Martin and I actually worked together for a number of years. Uh, I was the candidate uh, for Mid-Ulster before we came up with the strategy of actually standing Martin in that constituency. So I stood down in order that he would actually oh, right. st- stand for that. And he, he won that election against William McRae. And he got a very large vote, 25,000 within the constituency, which was unheard of. But Martin was a very much down-to-earth person. He was local in Derry. He lived in the bog city. He never moved out of the bog city. He was a fisherman. He'd done all the sort of the things that people like to do. Uh, but very much a people person. Very much of actually trying to deliver for people and trying to represent people. And, and took it all very seriously within that. And he, he was a very much a Republican and wanted to see Irish independence. And that was his main driving for it. But he also spent the last number of years and reconciliation of trying to reach out to everyone within his meeting with the Queen here in, in England and also in Ireland. The all of that was all part of reaching out to the broader community and trying to say to unionism, you know, I can represent your community as well. I can be I can I can meet with the people that you look up to, mm. the people that you feel are your representative, and I can be part of that. That we don't have to be separate within that. So I think Martin went out of his way to actually try and accommodate and to have reconciliation. But you know, his death was very sudden. It took us all by surprise, and he will be very much missed. This is my first election without Martin. In yeah. The so it, it certainly is very emotional in that sense, and it is hard to actually just to, to place his footsteps on the ground uh, because he was well known. He he got respected. He got votes from everywhere. And, and we found that, you know, again, that both sides of the community, both unionism and nationalism, even though they might have their differences with Martin, they were still very much prepared to work with him and to develop. And they, they started to realise that he had a deep interest in all of the people of Ireland and wanted to see the people of Ireland, North and South, coming together to deliver a new future for the young people and for the next generation. Jeremy Corbyn, who's the leader of the British Labour Party, obviously has got a lot of stick for his involvement with Sinn Féin um, politicians, particularly with Martin McGuinness, um, people like that. What do you think about that criticism that Jeremy Corbyn's received for merely kind of talking to people on the Sinn Féin side, for, you know, for engaging in debate? Do you think the criticism's kind of fair? No, I don't think it's fair at all. I think we all have an obligation where there's a conflict situation to try and resolve it, mm. where people are being killed in various different ways, where on this side of the, the water, where the bombs that were happening here in, Lo- in London and, and Birmingham and the uh, Manchester and various different cities, we have an obligation to try and bring that to an end and to resolve the conflict. And it's very unfair for people to pick out, and for the media to pick out Jeremy Corbyn in particular, uh, or Ken Livingstone and people yeah. like that, who did actually try to reach out and try and, try and to accommodate and try to listen to what we were saying. And the whenever you consider that Margaret Thatcher also talked to the IRA, and whenever she or security people were talking behind backs mm. to the IRA, so the you know Martin and and Jeremy Corbyn were meeting and Jerry Adams were meeting quite openly and having discussions and political discussions and trying to bring bring out our politics because one of the reasons for the IRA was because people weren't listening to the politics. You no, know, we had a one party state in the north for fifty years. There was no involvement with the nationalist community. There was discrimination. And so the IRA reacted. The civil rights campaign started off uh, looking for very basic demands of uh, one man, one boat, and a job and a house. And those were things that the British state couldn't deliver. And so the IRA reaction to all of that there led to a conflict. Now, we were trying to resolve that conflict from by political means. And, and people like Jeremy, Ken Livingston, and others went out on a bit of a limb at that particular time, and said, well, we want to understand. You know, and, you know, Tony Bain was another person who, you know, 
Sir Anthony Wedwood Bend, you know, who actually met with Republican leaders and tried mm-hmm. to accommodate. Uh, those are things that actually, and it shows that there's no big difference between people at the end of the day. And at the end of the day, you know, Maggie Thatcher decided that the Good Friday Agreement and other institutions could actually be of benefit. Uh, and it is very important that we actually move the situation into politics. And we also have to make politics work. And politics should be not a dirty word, but a good word in young people's minds. Just before we let you go, Francie, as well, obviously I appreciate the Westminster election, other than the Northern Irish part, isn't of too much interest to you. But how do you think it's going to go from a personal point of view? Well, I, I think we are underestimating the uh, the vote of Labour. Uh, and I think you know Jeremy Corbyn has been the target with it. But I think if you see some of the rallies and the support that's on the ground, whether it comes through in, in the actual vote at the end of the day, but I think you can see what he's trying to represent, a groundswell mm. of support on the ground where people are looking for better. People are looking for representation. They're looking... Like, the minority of people voted for their present government. Minorities shouldn't be electing governments. Majorities should be electing governments. So it's important that people come out to vote. doesn't matter where it is, whether it's with my own constituency or here or anywhere else, that it's important that people exercise that vote because once they stop voting, they lose power. So the way to, to bring back power to the ordinary people is to deliver it on the ground and to use their vote. Francie Malloy, thank you for joining me. Okay, thank Cheers. you.